Hey y'all, today we're doing day four. Today we're focusing on the home front. For homework, y'all looked at um, an oral history from somebody. Um, like, you know, And today we're going to just do an overview of um, different groups of folks, how the war affected them, and also how um, you know things that were happening on the home front. So um, I think one thing to make sure you remember is that... Um, FDR is going to sign the draft before Pearl Harbor. So this is the first United States peacetime draft. I think it's also an indication of sort of what we were talking about before, that that FDR is trying to get the nation ready for war before we are in war. Um, and he sees the kind of the, the writing on the wall of what is happening. Um, the next thing is with Pearl Harbor, um, you know, this is what's going to get us into the war in 1941. Um, and this is, um, yeah, 2,400 Americans are killed. And the U.S. Pacific Fleet is temporary, temporarily crippled. Um, so, you know, a lot of people wonder why did the Japanese attack the United States? I think it's because the Japanese knew that the United States was probably going to be um, getting involved in the war at some point. So they sort of thought that they could go in and knock out the U.S. military power before they were attacked. They also saw that um, embargo of oil and steel as an act of war. And a lot of people say that this was not meant to be a sneak attack. They actually did try to declare war before they attacked, but it got uh, it got kind of lost along the way. So there's even some questions, some more uh, skeptical people wonder whether or not FDR knew about the attack uh, before it and just kind of let it happen because he wanted to go to war. But um, less skeptical people say that they knew there might be an attack coming, but they did not have specifics. But anyway, Pearl Harbor happens, and this is what catapults the nation into war. You know, after we are attacked, after the United States is attacked, people just immediately enlist. Um, you know, America first, what we looked at before, they are just going to go away. Um, there is very little opposition to the war once we are attacked. Um... So even, there's not even enough barracks or material to help process all these people. Um, and since everyone is kind of thrown in together, it's going to break down a lot of cultural and class barriers um, while they are serving. That being said, we're going to go into segregated units later. So there is a lot of propaganda during the war, which is kind of racist. Um, some people point out the fact that a lot of the Japanese propaganda seems to be more racist than the German propaganda, but... Um, we're going to take a look at that. Um, one of the things that's going to happen after the attack on Pearl Harbor is Japanese internment. And what I do want to go over is what happened with Japanese internment before we get into um, some of this. So because we were attacked in Hawaii out here, people started to get worried about, you know, if the Japanese attacked the mainland. So what they do is they create what's called the exclusion area, which is here along the coast. And so um, FDR is going to issue Executive Order uh, 9066. And what he's going to say is that we are going to take Japanese people out of here and move them inland. So we're going to move them to places like Heart Mountain, um, you know, Topaz. Probably the most famous one is Manazar. Um, so we're moving people off of the coast and inland um, away from the coast. Now, the strategic reason for this is because they say um, in the case of an attack, they do not want Japanese people to be along the coast to um, help abate or help, you know, help you know, the Japanese fleets come in. So this is why they are removed from the coast. Now, why are we focusing on the Japanese? So one, strategically, FDR is going to say, well, we were attacked in Hawaii. This is a strategic reason. This is why we have to remove them. Now, the other thing is there's a long history of anti-Japanese sentiment in California, which is going to help us along. Um, they are falsely accused. There is no evidence of any sort of sabotage or espionage that was ever found. So, you know, even though FDR said it was a strategic reason, there wasn't really a, um, people think that there was not a legitimate threat. That There wasn't anything you could really point to and say this group of people was definitively trying to help the Japanese invade. But um, there is a lot of anti-Japanese propaganda. 
Um, so Japanese folks along the coast, um, when they are to told to leave, they try to object. They say, you know, I am an American. Um, most of these people, two thirds of the people who are removed are American citizens. They're trying to show their loyalty. And even while they're in the camps, they try to show their American loyalty. Um, but the consequences are dire because they are forced to sell their homes. They are forced to sell their property. It's estimated that they lose up to $2 billion. And then they are put into these like hastily made camps in the middle of nowhere, usually like in the desert with barbed wire enclosures, barracks, cots, very little food, um, and just forced to stay there um, and be supervised. Um, and again, these people have done, you know, nothing wrong. That being said, it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Korematsu is going to refuse to obey the relocation order, and he takes it all the way to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court is actually going to say that this is okay. That because the government... Um, because they have a valid use of presidential wartime power, because they felt like it was a threat, it is okay. Um, now, the other thing is the Korematsu case is still good law. It's never really been overturned. We are going to apologize for it, but we never overturn it. And I think it's also important to remember that Japanese um, troops fight in the war. They are one of the most decorated combat units in the United States history. So um, Japanese soldiers are going to fight with distinction. And again, even while people are relocated, they are trying to prove their loyalty. Um, we do intern other groups as well. Um, some Germans and Italians, um, but not, it is similar, but it's just not as many people. Um, so again, in 1988, we do give uh, reparations to people who are interned, $20,000. We apologize, but we never overturn the law. Women in World War II, they are going to be taking many of the jobs and services. Um, you know, whenever you see the propaganda for women during this time, a lot of the times what the AP tries to focus on is like this wartime propaganda. Um... And, you know, you have to consider why is the United States focusing? Well, because what they're trying to basically do... Oh, I kind of misspelled this. Oh, well. Uh, what they're trying to basically do is tell women, you know, it's okay to work. You know, go outside of your sphere. You're still a woman. Uh, this is, you know, good for you. It's good for the country. And so there is a big effort to try to say, you know, get women to get out of the homes and into the industry because so many people are serving in the war. Some women are going to be um, working in um, the military itself. They're what they call like women's auxiliary groups. So like the waves and the wax and all of these other things. And, and usually what women would do when they're in the military is try to do things that would allow more men to go on the front line. So they would do nursing jobs, clerical work, communication jobs, um, you know, a lot of these would be what they are doing. Now, one group that did actually, um, you know, uh, the WASPs, the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, um, these women are actually kind of famous because they actually flew planes during the war, um, but they didn't do combat missions. So what they would do is, like, relocate planes that needed to be done um, during this time. Um, probably the most famous, uh, symbol of women working is Rosie the Riveter. We can do it. Um, it is based on a worker. Um, and, you know, it's just an example of showing women as being strong. Uh, you know, you can get into the workforce, um, kind of encouraging women to get out of their domestic sphere. Women in the home are also focused on for like victory gardens and, you know, kind of doing other voluntary things like scrap metal drives. I've actually heard that these scrap metal drives actually didn't do a whole lot. Like they weren't actually used, but it made people feel better. But yeah, iron, aluminum, kind of like what we would call recycling today and gardening for the war effort. Um, nearly 20 million started gardens, 9 million tons of produce. So this is a big kind of effort. So one of the things that's different about World War II than World War I, and this kind of also ties in with the New Deal, um, 
also is just the president had sweeping new powers. There is a huge amount of power given to the federal government. Whereas World War I was kind of seen as voluntary, World War II is going to actually force people to do things. Um, so FDR is going to have, you know, the Office of War Information. This is like government cre created propaganda. So whenever you see something produced by the government, consider that it is government propaganda. Um, the other thing, though, is that kind of voluntarily the entertainment industry is going to uh, support the war effort. I mean, a lot of people have probably seen things like, uh, you can watch this if you want later, you know, the Ducktators, um, you know, like Looney Tunes, Superman, uh, I think Captain America even at the time, you know, everyone in their themes of all of their movies is going to be, you know, fighting Nazis and supporting the war effort. So, you know, patriotism is a common theme. And so, you know, the entertainment industry in movies and radio are also supporting the war effort and they're not, they're doing it sort of voluntarily. Um, you know, the other thing is that the United States and this kind of arsenal of democracy, the one thing that Japan did not account for when they thought they could just knock out U.S. military power was how quickly we could recover. Um, and so while we're rationing scarce goods, we're putting full effort into the, uh, the war machine. Um, and it, this is being coordinated by what's called the War Production Board. And so the actual federal government ensured the military had resources. It would actually tell, you know, the, um, it would tell, you know, independent corporations, like, you are going to produce this many Jeeps. You are going to do this. And this is a part of that war power, um, you know, in telling people how they're going to use their resources. Financing the war is always a problem. People are going to be paying income taxes and war bonds. We talked about war bonds in World War One, but again, these are just, you know, you know, you buy a loan, you loan the government uh, money now so they could use it for the war and then you get it back later. And a lot of celebrities are going to be trying to promote war bonds. This is also one of the main focuses of a lot of the propaganda. Um, so yeah, here's some of the propaganda, you know, buy war bonds, do it for America. This is, you know, the good fight. One of the things about um, World War One is that people were told, like, hey, don't eat meat on Mondays. Uh, please grow a victory garden. Um, you know, uh, give up drinking. Well, they actually made that illegal. But anyway, um, rationing is going to be an actual government um, system where you are given points. Um, gasoline was particularly rationed uh, because it had to go for the war effort. There is a black market, but... So essentially what you would have to do is if I want to go buy milk, I would have to um, give the store owner not just money, but coupons that would say I have permission to buy this much milk for my family this week. Um, this is not voluntary. It is, you know, rationed by the government. Um, so the economic impact is that essentially almost everybody, you know, kind of says that the World War II got us out of the Depression. Now... You know, as someone who believes in the broken windows theory, you know, we could have gotten out of the depression if we did this level of spending for anything. We didn't have to do it for war, but we did do it for war. So federal civilian employment is going to triple. You have female employment. You have labor unions growing, but you do have a huge national debt. So when we talked about Keynesian economics, the fact that like the government should spend money to put people into work, this is what the war did. Um even more than the New Deal. People are going to be moving um, into um, different places. The West is going to become an economic powerhouse. California, especially because of like, you know, um, industry that is there, southern shipyards, textiles. The South is going to see a lot of prosperity. This leads me to African Americans in the war. Um, you know, it is always kind of ironic that we are are fighting a racist or fascist re regime while we are experiencing racism at home. And this does not go um, unnoticed by many folks, especially African Americans at the time. So, you know, we're not going to probably get into the civil rights campaign, but you can consider the beginning of the civil rights campaign to be World War II. Um, 
double victory campaign, victory over uh, fascism abroad and racism at home. This needs to happen in both ways. And so in the double V campaign, they said they were going to march on Washington if, um, you know, to, to support equality at home. And um, this is actually called off because FDR is going to um, allow, is, he's going to desegregate fe federal jobs. Um, and of course, African Americans are going to be heroes in the war, as they are in every single war. Um, the most famous is like some of the Tuskegee Airmen. Some of y'all listen to that um, oral history. Um, but again, they're proving themselves superior to white pilots, but they are still facing discrimination in all forms. And so when we talked about the Double V campaign, uh, a. Philip Randolph is the one who was trying to organize a march on Washington, and FDR convinced him to cancel the march because he, he makes the Fair Employment Act, which allows um, desegregation. Native Americans are also going to be involved in the World War II, um, most famously as the Navajo Code Talkers. Um, because Navajos had their own language, they would basically have to put... Uh, one of these folks in with the different um, troops and they would have to break the code from other places. It was never broken. Um, and more than just Navajo code talkers, Native Americans fought with um, accomplishment in World War II. Um, in immigration, the United States is actually going to encourage Mexican labor to come into the United States in what's called the Bracero Program. Um, essentially what they want to have is Mexicans come in to do, um, labor, especially farm work in California. There are a lot of human rights abuses, but the United States wants these folks to come in because they need to harvest the fields. Now, although the United States wants to encourage immigration, there is a lot of nativist sentiments and racism. Uh, most famously is the Zoot Suit Riots. Um, this is a conflict between sailors and uh, young Mexican-Americans in um, Los Angeles. So part of this is obviously racism and nativism, you know, anti-immigrant appeal. But some of it is also tied to, like, the politics of World War II. I'm trying to get this to work. Come on, buddy. Boop. Uh, boop. We could do this. Anyway. Um, if you take a look at the guys, so, you know, during this time of rationing, you would have, um, people who didn't really buy a lot of new clothes, you know, your people are giving up nylons, uh, the zoot suits were these very kind of like ostentatious baggy clothing, um, and two people who were in the military, they felt like this kind of clothing was, uh, not patriotic, like you should be giving up, um, all of that for the war effort. So obviously it is racism, it is nativism, and it's tied in with like the politics of the time when military service members essentially beat up um, young Mexican-Americans, Filipinos, wearing these zoot suits. Um, the election of 1944, FDR is going to um, get a fourth term. This is unheard of um, in 1944. And shortly after, he is going to die um, right before the war is going to end. He is going to, uh, Truman is going to take office. He was vice president for only 82 days. Um, we're going to take a look at the atomic bomb next after this assessment. And he is the president of the Cold War. We're going to have victory in Europe and victory in Japan in 1945. Um, and this is the end of the war. We're going to take more look at the military aspect of the war. We're going to take a look at the Japanese, like, island hopping next time. Um, and we're going to kind of look at like, why we used the bomb um, next class. So, um, yeah, do the assessment for today, and hopefully um, it all makes sense. Give me an email if you have any questions. Take care.